we're going to have more pediat more uh, neuro oncologists shortly, so this is good. So I'd like to talk about today, and let me give you the the summary of of, of the talk, um, which is basically that the general thought is that regulatory T cells um, have increased function in tumor beds, therefore preventing um, the effector cells from eliminating the tumor. Uh, and I'd like to show you today that, that, at least in glioblastomas, that does not appear to be the case, but that the regulatory T cells in the brain of patients with GBMs, which express high amounts of PD-1 and uh, the molecule TIM3, may be exhausted, and, uh, but certainly do not seem to suppress. And uh, we believe that they become exhausted trying to stop uh, all the inflammatory CD4 and CD8 cells that go into the tumor bed and can't um, stop the tumor. So in, uh, what I'll talk about is, uh, and uh, this is still a 30-minute talk, a brief overview of co-stimulatory checkpoints for the non-hardcore immunologists, particularly PD-1 and, and TIM-3, which involved in this discovery when I was in Boston with Vijay Kutru, and its expression on CD4 effector cells and glioblastoma. Uh, then we'll jump to some basic immunology, looking at the function of CD4 cells from healthy subjects, which express PD-1, talk about the frequency of Tregs and gliomas, and the expression of PD-1, TIM-3, and then back to uh, normal, healthy individuals, and look at the Tregs, then back to look at the Tregs and glioblastoma. That is, we'll go back and forth between what we observe in patients with brain tumors, and then modeling it uh, with T cells from normal subjects. So in terms of immunology, uh, basically summarize the field of, of immunology uh, in one slide. Uh, one has T cell presentation, uh, macrophages present antigen, the context of class two, recognized by a T cell receptor. And if you are a lumper, you can divide CD4 cells into TH1 uh, cells, which involve in, uh, inflammation, intracellular pathogens, TH2 cells, involved in B cell health. But perhaps most importantly for those of us interested in autoimmunity, um, uh, TH17 cells, which appear to be the predominant cell involved in inducing autoimmune disease, uh, which is regulated uh, by RORC in humans, and then the regulatory T cells, which express FOXP3 uh, and, uh, and IL-10. Uh, We've been very interested in regulatory T cells that discovered by Shimon Sagaguchi um, gee, almost 20 years ago. And our laboratory, which is a translational laboratory, were able to identify uh, T regs in, in humans by noting that they express very high amounts of the IL-2 receptor. And we've been investigating them in patients with autoimmune disease, and we've shown that they're dysfunctional, that they do not suppress. Um, so when we had the opportunity of studying glioblastomas mm -hmm. and getting brain tissue, we said, gee, we can try to understand why they're hyperfunctional. Of course, they're not. And perhaps whatever the brain tumors are doing, we could use it to treat autoimmune disease. If one summarizes the uh, various co-stimulatory molecules, uh, there's the CTLA-4 uh, B71, B72, CTLA-4 gives a negative, a co-inhibition signal, as does PD-1. I'm sure this, this group knows this very well. And the ligands of PD-L1 and PD-L2. So modulating uh, immune checkpoints, you have a T cell, the expression is various molecules, you have an antigen presenting cell, again, which stimulate through the T cell receptor, expresses co-stimulatory signals, which can either induce an immune response or with CTLA-4 inhibited immune response. Uh, and tumor cells, as this, in this group well knows, expresses PDL1, which can inhibit T cell responses. So we're interested in the role that regulatory T cells and CD4 cells may, may play uh, in a glioblastoma. Um, I, uh, though trained as a neurologist, I basically left neurology for about 20 years doing more basic and human immunology. I came back to neurology when I became the chair here some five years ago and was somewhat astonished to find that the treatment for glioblastoma had not really changed. The survival rate uh, remained very dismal, even with surgical resection, radiation, chemotherapy, and anti-VEGF, uh, basically uh, the diagnosis of glioblastoma was a death sentence. We're very interested in applying immunotherapies, and right now we are in the midst of an anti-PD-1, anti-CUSLA-4 clinical trial here at Yale in the multiple centers for treating uh, these tumors. And I hope very soon to be able to come back 
uh, with some of the results of those trials and some of the immune investigations we're doing. But as part of the trial, we're able to get um, T cells from the brain tissue of patients with glioblastoma. Now, I should just relay that to someone who studies MS, uh, how exciting it was to be able to get tissue from the actual tumor bed itself, the tissue itself, because we, we don't do brain biopsies or remove brain. People don't like removing brain tissue, don't like giving up brain tissue. Dermatologists take skin and it's okay, but for various reasons, which are reasonably obvious, people do not like giving up brain, uh, unless there's a tumor. So it was very nice to be able to be able to directly investigate the tissue side itself. And I should say that all this work was performed by Dan Lowther in our laboratory, uh, who really developed the, this whole project. So basically, we did the t simple type of tissue processing. We chopped up with scissors, did a collagenase digest, resuspended the tissue on the percol gradient, and took the uh, uh, the interphase of the cellular uh, the cellular infiltrate and then did subsequent analysis. So we can actually look at the T cells from the tumor bed and compare it to peripheral blood. So I'll just now show you a number of slides representative of what we found. So the first is that there's PD-1 expression on the TILs, on the tumor inf infiltrating lymphocytes. So the white is peripheral blood. The black uh, is the tumor bed. Um, here are CD4 cells, percent expressing PD-1 and the percent CD8 cells expressing PD-1. And one can see that compared to peripheral blood, the T cells in the tumor bed express high amounts of, of PD-1, again, the ligand being PD-L1. So that was interesting and not unexpected. And it led us to look at the function of CD4 cells from healthy subjects expressing PD-1. Now, I would assume that uh, someone else would have just simply sorted PD-1 positive and PD-1 negative T cells and looked at them functionally or at least that we may have done it some 10 years ago when, uh, when I was in Boston, Gordon Freeman first uh, with Arlene Sharp identified uh, the uh, PD-1 and we started playing with it. But it turns out we hadn't in the very simple experiment, if you take PD-1 positive T cells, uh, they don't enter in the cell cycle. So here's a percent proliferation. Uh, uh, actually, let me show the, the, this um, CFSC stain. Let me explain this technique for those of you not familiar with it. Uh, actually, who here is familiar with the CFSC technique, just out of curiosity? Anyone? One person? Okay. So I'll explain it. It's a really neat technique. You basically take a T cell, or it can be any cell, and you load up with a green dye. So it's very green. So here's an example of uh, the more you go to the right, the more green it is. So uh, here is a cell that's not undergone cell cycle, and it has a lot of green. Uh, if you then induce it by cross-linking this T cell receptor to undergo cell cycle proliferation, every uh, time it, the cell divides, there's less green and goes in half. So you can measure the number of cell cycle divisions by uh, measuring how much green dye. So here, if you take PD-1 positive effector cells and cross-link the T cell receptor, it does not enter in the cell cycle. If you take total T cells, you have very, very nice entry in the cell cycle of PD-1 negative T effector cells. So it says that these PD-1 positive cells that we're isolating from brain tumors, bladder cancer, uh, lung tumors, they don't, they don't proliferate. They do not clonally expand when they recognize their antigen. But they do make cytokines. So if you look at total T effector cells, PD-1 negative, PD-1 positive cells, this is looking at IL-17 versus gamma interferon. This is the percentage here. If you cross-link the T cell receptor with anti-CD28 for CD4 cells, make a bit of gamma, a little bit of IL-17. Same thing with PD-negative T effector cells. But the PD-1 positive T effector cells make a ton of gamma interferon. So they're not entering the cell cycle, but they are making uh, gamma interferon, other cytokines. And here's a summary of multiple experiments. So then we looked at the frequency of Tregs in gliomas and its expression of PD-1 and TIM3. And it's been known for some time uh, that there is increased patient survival linked to tumor-associated Tregs, um, and that there's an increased frequency of these FOXP, FOXP3 positive Tregs as measured by <laughs> immunocytochemistry in patients with glioblastoma. 
And we've uh, actually confirmed that. So if you look at the frequency, again, we're going to look at the function also. This is just the frequency. If you look at the frequency of these T rays, it's measured by this uh, CD25 high, CD127 low, FOXP3 high, how we identify T rays in humans. There are more of them in patients with, uh, with glioblastoma. This is grade two, three, four. Grade four is the most malignant. Grade two is so-called benign, but they tend to convert to malignant over decades. So indeed, there were more Tregs, and when you looked at them functionally, uh, this is looking at Tregs from, um, uh, the, the, these are Tregs in T-effector cells, isolated from the brain tissue of a patient with glioblastoma. They expressed both TIM3 and PD-1. So it's a TIM3 expression on the y-axis, uh, PD-1 expression on the x-axis. And you can see that they are uh, PD-1 positive, TIM-3 positive. Same with the, T with the CD4 vector cells. And we found this curious because if you look in peripheral blood normal individuals, there's no TIM-3 expression. We've never seen that before. So here if you look at summary of about a dozen patients looking at TIM-3 positive Tregs, uh, that one has, in fact, a marked increased frequency of TIM3 uh, on the CD4 effector cells, or TIM3 on, on Tregs. Uh, and with grade 4 glioma, there's a much higher frequency of, of Tregs. I didn't go into the biology of TIM3. That would be a talk in itself. But TIM3 is expressed on T cells with energy induction. So there's a marked decrease in TIM3 expression on CD4 cells in patients with MS. So uh, TIM3 is expressed with clonal exhaustion, with HIV infection, uh, and it leads to a state of clonal energy. Uh, so then if you look at the present of PD-1 positive, TIM-3 positive Tregs, and this is peripheral blood and white, tumor and black, you can see a marked increase in the frequency of these PD-1 positive, TIM-3 positive T cells uh, in the tumor bed, particularly in patients with glioblastoma. What's also interesting is you can see them in the peripheral blood, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but it's of interest because if you look in the peripheral blood of healthy controls, there is basically, basically no TIM3 positive, PD1 positive cells. So one thing I really think we should be doing um, prospectively is to get blood from new onset patients with glioblastoma and potentially other tumors and look for the expression of PD1 and TIM3 because it may be a marker uh, certainly of more, malignant, uh, more malignancy in glioblastomas. Um, so then we looked at the, uh, the expression of circulating PD-1 TIM-3 uh, in, again, in peripheral, this is a peripheral blood, like in Tregs and T-effector cells. We just look at the bottom panel that presented PD-1 positive TIM-3. Again, uh, you see this about half a percent of um, T-effector and Tregs, which express both molecules. Uh, so I think this is a test worth doing, and we should explore doing both in glioblastomas and other tumors. So then we want to look at the function of Tregs from healthy subjects expressing PD-1. So we have these T cells, these Tregs, we isolated them from the tumor bed, they express PD-1. Uh, and so what is a function in normal healthy individuals for the PD-1 positive Tregs? We can't do this with TIM-3 because there's no expression of TIM-3 in normal individuals. And here's that CFSC assay again. Let me take you through this slide. So I'm going to show you that PD-1 positive Tregs have impaired suppressive function, but they also make cytokines. So here's an assay we use for measuring regulatory T cell function in humans. So if you take CD4 cells, load them with a green dye, and whack the T cell receptor, they go into cell cycle, and you can see the dilution of green in the cells. If you add Tregs to the culture, you go from here to here. The Tregs suppress entry in the cell cycle. And these are the assays that we've used over the decades to look at function of Tregs in humans. If you take the PD-1, um, uh, this is the PD-1 uh, positive, the PD-1 negative Tregs, you can see they also suppress about the same. You add them to the culture, you go from here to here. But when you take the PD-1 positive Tregs over here, they don't suppress at all. It looks like this. So it says that the PD-1 positive Tregs don't suppress. If we look at six healthy subjects that we did this with, you can see this market inability of PD-1 positive Tregs to suppress. So again, that was funny. Uh, the, the hypothesis was that Tregs don't work. 
I mean, it worked very well. We saw the PD-1 positive T-Rex, so we said, well, let's now look at the, um, uh, at, at the function of the PD-1 T-Rex. So then we looked at the PD-1 positive T-Rex. Again, this is in healthy subjects. And you see here's total T-Rex. They make IL-2 and a little bit of gamma interferon. Same with PD-1 negative T-Rex. But if you look at the positive one, uh, the PD-1 positive T-Rex over here, you can see that they're making about a 17-fold increase in gamma interferon. So again, the PD-1 positive T-Rex in healthy subjects are don't suppress and they're making gamma interferon. And as a individual, as someone interested in autoimmune disease, we found this interesting because this is the same phenotype we see in multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes, that the Tregs don't suppress and then make gamma interferon. Um, and then we asked what happens if you do an in vitro experiment if you block with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1, and the anti-PD-1 was kindly uh, supplied by Li Ping Chen. Uh, so this is an ice-type control, T effectors alone or looking at the Treg suppressor assay, that the anti-PD-L1 or anti-PD-1, you have more entry into cell cycles, take the PD-1 positive cells that don't proliferate very well and block PD-L1 or PD-1, they do, they do proliferate better, but the Tregs, have, the anti-PD-1 has no effect. So here's uh, the, the uh, Tregs, degree suppression, the degree suppression doesn't change all with blocking. So just to end, so what's the function of Tregs in glioblastoma? So we directly examined the functionality of Tregs in glioblastoma, which hadn't been done before, and here's the data suggesting, in fact, that they do not suppress as well. Direct your attention to the right. So this is suppression with peripheral blood, uh, matched peripheral blood from the same individual. Then we used the CD4 cells from the blood of the same subject and isolated the Tregs from the, from the brain tissue. These are heroic experiments that Dan Lowther did. Uh, it's not easy to get enough Tregs to do these assays. But again, we we're very surprised to see, because we thought this would be up here, they'd be more suppressive. But indeed, um, at the one ratio we can test, they clearly did not suppress as well uh, as uh, matched peripheral blood Tregs. And finally, we looked at the T effector cytokine release from the CD4 cells, isolated directly from the brain of patient glioblastoma. Uh, they have the phenotype of the PD-1 positive, uh, TIM positive, TIM3 positive cells, make more IL-2, and they make more uh, gamma interferon. And if you look at the Treg uh, cytokine release, again, taking Tregs directly from the brain tissue, they're making more gamma interferon, more IL-2. So the uh, in vitro experiments of healthy subjects, uh, PD-1 positive cells, look a lot like what we see in terms of the PD-1 positive cells isolated from the brain tissue. And finally, um, if we take the Tregs directly from the blood, we, we, we can't, we don't have enough cells to isolate in a PD-1 positive, TIM-3 positive from the peripheral blood. So we've taken, uh, from the brain tumor that is, so we took the PD-1 positive, TIM-3 positive Tregs from the peripheral blood of patient with glioblastoma, looked at their percent suppression, and you can see that the PD-1 positive, TIM-3 positive Tregs isolated from the blood of patients with glioblastoma have decreased suppressive function. So we hypothesized, and um, this could probably be why the paper got rejected because the immunologists didn't like this, but we'll try again. Um, we said that maybe they're, they're exhausted. Uh, we know in the HIV field that the TIM3 positive, PD-1 positive CD8 cells are clonally exhausted, and that's accepted. Um, we said maybe the PD-1, CD4 positive uh, Tregs um, are exhausted and therefore should have shortened telomeres, so we directly looked at that. Here's a PD-1 positive, then this is in normal individuals, PD-1 positive, PD-1 negative. You can see PD-1 positive indeed have shortened telomeres, suggesting that they may be clonally exhausted. Whatever they are, uh, they're dysfunctional. So in, in summary of the talk, uh, CD4 effect in regulatory T cells in the brain of patients with glioblastoma expressing PD-1 and TIM-3 appeared to be clonally exhaustive, but certainly they do not function uh, as well as the PD-1 um, PD negative cells. And uh, I should just end, well, let me just show the acknowledgement slide again. I really want to acknowledge Dan Lowther, uh, who has developed uh, this, this technology in the laboratories, unfortunately, going back to the UK. Uh, but I um, uh, want to thank Marat Gunnell, Joe P. Meyer, and others, Wacom and Kevin, for supplying tissue. But let me just make the point that we, we've set up a platform 
In coming here, we've set up a platform for autoimmunity where we take patients with MS, type 1 diabetes, RA, lupus, and the samples routinely sent to 300 George to the HTI, Human Translational Immunology Laboratories. We have robotics, we run the samples, and we have a whole team to do that. And these, uh, these uh, experiments are now being taken over by Kadir Radasi, who's a professional scientist. So all the samples coming in now run on these platforms. And we look forward to using these tools and technologies to look at uh, other tumors beside uh, glioblastomas, which is, of course, the most important tumor to look at. Right, Roy? Thank you very much.